Page 80. Grover won't get in too much trouble, will he? I asked Chiron. I mean, he was a good protector, really. Chiron sighed. Grover has big dreams, Percy, perhaps bigger than he can reach. To reach his goal, he must first show great courage by finding a new camper and bringing him safely to Half-Blood Hill. But he did that. Dionysus and the Council of Cloven Elders must decide if he really did. They might disagree with you. After all, Grover lost you in New York. Then there's the unfortunate, uh, fate of your mother, and the fact that Grover was unconscious when you dragged him into camp. I wanted to protest. None of what happened was Grover's fault. I also felt really, really guilty. If I hadn't left Grover at the bus station, he might not have gotten in trouble. He'll get a second chance, won't he? I'm afraid that was Grover's second chance, Percy. The first time did not go well, five years ago. He's still small for his age. How old is he? Page 81. Oh, 28. What? And he's in sixth grade? Satyrs grow as half as fast as humans, Percy. Grover has been like a middle school student for the past six years. That's horrible. Quite horrible, Chiron, Chiron agreed. Grover is a slow learner, even for a satyr. He might not get another chance. That's not fair, I said. What happened the first time? Was it really so bad? Chiron looked away. Let's move along, shall we? But now I thought about what Chiron said about my mother. He had never said she died. Maybe she wasn't dead. Chiron, I said, if the gods and Olympus are all and all that are real. Yes, child. Does that mean the underworld is real too? Yes, child. Page 82. Chiron paused as if choosing his words carefully. The underworld is a place where spirits go after death. But for now, until we know more, I would advise you to put that out of your mind. What do you mean, until we know more? Come, Percy. Here are the woods. The woods are full if you care to try your luck, but go armed with a weapon. Full of what, I asked, and what weapon? You'll see. Capture the flag is Friday night. Do you have your own sword and shield? My own? No, Chiron said, I suppose you don't. I think a size five will do. I'll visit the armory later. We saw the archery range, the canoeing lake, the stables where the horses were kept, the javelin range, the sing-along amphitheater, and the arena where Chiron said they held sword and spear fights. Page 83. Sword and spear fights, I asked. All campers share cabins, he explained. Sometimes the cabins challenge each other in a sword fight. They're not deadly, usually. Oh yes, and there's the mess hall where everyone eats. Chiron pointed to a dozen stone picnic tables. There was no roof covering them, just Greek pillars all around. Finally, he showed me the cabins. There were twelve of them in the woods by the lake. They were arranged in a U with two at the base and five in a row on either side. Each cabin had a large number above the door. Odd numbers on the left side, evens on the right. They all looked different. Number four had tomato vines on the walls and a roof made out of real grass. Cabin seven seemed to be made of solid gold. Number nine had smokestacks, like a tiny factory. They all faced an area about the size of a soccer field, full of Greek statues, fountains, flowers, and a couple of basketball hoops. In the center of the field was a fire pit. Cabin 1 was the biggest. Its doors looked like they had lightning bolts on them. Cabin 2 was decorated with pomegranates and flowers and carvings of peacocks. Does each cabin represent a different god? Is this the one with the lightning bolts for Zeus? And the one with the flowers for his wife Hera, I guessed? Correct, Chiron said. Their cabins look empty. Several of the cabins are empty. Okay, so there were twelve cabins for the twelve gods of Mount Olympus, but why would some be empty? I stopped in front of cabin three. It was long and low. The outer walls were of stone with pieces of seashell and coral. Inside it smelled salty like the wind from the ocean at Montauk. There were six empty bunk beds with silk sheets. The place felt so sad and lonely. 
Most of the other cabins were crowded with campers. Number five looked like someone had splashed bright red paint all over it. The roof was lined with barbed wire. A stuffed wild boar's head hung over the doorway, and its eyes seemed to watch me. Inside, I could see a bunch of mean-looking kids, both girls and boys, arm-wrestling and arguing with each other. Rock music blared. The loudest kid was maybe was a girl, maybe 13 or 14. Page 85. She wore a size XXXL Camp Half-Blood t-shirt under a camouflage jacket. She zeroed in on me and gave me an evil sneer. She reminded me of Nancy Bobo Fit, but bigger with long, stringy brown hair. Are you really the Chiron from the stories? I asked Chiron. You're tra- you trained Hercules to be a hero fighter? Yes, Percy, I am. But shouldn't you be dead by now? That's an interesting question. I don't know if I should be dead. The truth is, I can't be dead. Long ago I asked the gods if I could teach heroes, as long as humans needed me. I'm still here, so I guess I'm still needed. Doesn't it ever get boring to be a teacher for three thousand years, I asked. No, no, he said. Horribly depressing at times, but never boring. Why is it depressing sometimes? Page 86. Chiron seemed to not hear me again. Oh, look, he said, Annabeth is waiting for us. The blonde girl I'd met at the big house was reading a book in front of cabin number 11. She looked at me like she was still thinking about how I drooled while sleeping. I tried to see what she was reading, but I couldn't read the title. I thought my dyslexia was acting up. Then I realized the title wasn't even in English. It was in Greek. Annabeth, Chiron said, would you take Percy from here? Yes, sir. This is cabin 11, Chiron told me. Make yourself at home. Cabin 11 looked like looked the most like a regular summer camp cabin, but old. The threshold was worn down, the brown paint peeling. Over the doorway was one of those doctor's symbols, page 87. A winged pole with two snakes wrapped around it. What did they call it? A caduceus. Inside it was packed with people, both boys and girls. There were not enough beds. Sleeping bags were spread all over on the floor. When the campers saw Chiron, they all stood and bowed respectfully. Chiron said, good luck, Percy, I'll see you at dinner, and galloped away. I stood in the doorway looking at the kids. They weren't bowing anymore. They were staring at me, sizing me up. I knew this feeling of being the new kid. I'd gone through it at enough schools. But of course I tripped coming in the door. Some of the campers snickered. Annabeth announced, Percy Jackson, meet cabin 11. An older teenage guy came forward. Welcome, Percy. You can have that spot on the floor. The guy was about 19, and he looked pretty cool. He was tall and muscular, with short, sandy hair and a friendly smile. He wore an orange tank top, cut-off jeans, sandals, and a leather necklace with five different colored clay beads. There was a thick white scar that ran from just beneath his right eye to his jaw, like an old knife slash. This is Luke, Annabeth said, and I noticed she was blushing. He's your counselor for now. For now, I asked. You're undetermined, Luke explained. They don't know what cabin to put you in, so you're here. Cabin 11 takes all newcomers, all visitors. Our cabin god is Hermes, the god of travelers. I looked at the tiny section of floor they'd given me. I had nothing to put there. No luggage, no clothes, no sleeping bag. Just the minotaur's horn. I thought about putting that down, but then I remembered that Hermes was also the god of thieves. I looked around at the campers' faces, some sullen and suspicious, some grinning stupidly, some eyeing me as if they were waiting for a chance to pick my pockets. How long will I be here? I asked. Good question, Luke said, until you're determined. Page 89. How long will that take? The campers all laughed. Annabeth grabbed my wrist and dragged me outside. Jackson, you have to do better than that. What? She rolled her eyes and mumbled. I can't believe I thought you were the one. What do you mean, the one? I was getting angry now. All I know is I killed some bull guy. Don't talk like that, Annabeth told me. You know how many kids at this camp wished they'd had your chance to fight the Minotaur? That's what we all train for. 
page 90. I shook my head. First of all, I don't get why fighting the Minotaur means I'm lucky. Second, is, is the thing I fought really the Minotaur the same one in the stories? Yes, but he died already. Theseus killed him in the labyrinth. Monsters don't die, Percy. They can be killed, but they don't die. They can come back. They don't have souls like you and me. Chiron calls them archetypes. You can dispel them for a while, but eventually they reform. I thought about Mrs. Dodds. You mean if I killed one accidentally with a sword, then eventually it will come back? The Fury, I mean, your math teacher? That's right, she's still out there. You just made her very, very mad. How did you know about Mrs. Dodds? You talk in your sleep. Page 91. She's a Fury? A Fury is one of those creatures that live in the underworld with the god Hades, right? Annabeth looked down nervously. You shouldn't call them by name, even here. We call them the kindly ones. Look, is there any name we are allowed to say? I whined. Why do I have to stay in cabin 11 anyway? Why is everybody so crowded together? There is plenty of room in the empty cabins. Annabeth turned pale. You don't just choose a cabin, Percy. It depends on who your parents are. Or your parent. My mom is Sally Jackson, I said. She works at a candy store. At least, she used to. I'm sorry about your mom, Percy, but I'm talking about your other parent, your dad. He's dead. I never knew him. Your father's not dead, Percy. How do you know that? Page 92. Because I know that you're one of us, Percy. You don't know anything about me. No, she raised an eyebrow. I bet you are just like us. I bet you moved around from school to school. I bet you were kicked out of a lot of them. I bet you were diagnosed with dyslexia, probably ADHD too. I swallowed, embarrassed. What does that have to do with anything? The dyslexia is a sign. You have trouble reading English because your mind is hardwired for ancient Greek. And the ADHD is a sign too. In the classroom, you're impulsive. That's your battle reflexes. In a real fight, those things would keep you alive. You have attention problems because you see too much, Percy. Your senses are better than a regular mortal's. Of course the teachers want you medicated. Most of the teachers are monsters. They don't want you to see what they are. You sound like you went through the same thing. Most of the kids here did. If you weren't like us, you couldn't have survived the Minotaur or the Ambrosia and Nectar. Page 93. Ambrosia and nectar? The food and drink we were giving you to make you better. That stuff would have killed a normal kid. It would have turned your blood to fire and your bones to sand, and you'd be dead. Face it, you're a half-blood. A half-blood. I had so many questions, I didn't know where to start. Then a voice yelled, Well, a newbie. I looked over. The big girl from the ugly red cabin was coming toward us. She had three other girls behind her, all big and ugly and mean, looking like her, all wearing camo jackets. Who's this little runt? The big girl growled. Percy Jackson, Annabeth said. Meet Clarisse, daughter of Ares. I blinked. Page 94. Ares? The war god? Clarisse sneered. You got a problem with that? We got a welcome ceremony for newbies, Prissy. Percy. Whatever. Come on, I'll show you. Clarice, Annabeth tried to say. Stay out of it, wise girl. Before I knew it, Clarice had me by the neck and was dragging me toward the girls' bathroom. There was a line of toilets on one side and a line of shower stalls down the other. It smelled just like any public bathroom. Page 95. Clarice's friends were all laughing, and I was trying to find the strength I'd use to fight the Minotaur, but it just wasn't there. He thinks he's big three material, Clarice said as she pushed me toward one of the toilets. Yeah, right. The Minotaur probably fell over laughing. He was so stupid looking. Her friends snickered. Annabeth stood in the corner watching through her fingers. Clarice bent me over on my knees and started pushing my head toward the toilet bowl. I was looking at the scummy water, thinking, I will not go into that. I won't. Then something happened. 
I felt a tug in the pit of my stomach. I heard the pipes rumble. Clarice let go of my hair. Water shot out of the toilet over my head, and the next thing I knew, it was hitting Clarice straight in the face so hard, it pushed her down onto her butt. Then the water pushed her backward into a shower stall. She struggled, gasping, and her friends started coming toward her. But then the other toilets exploded too, and six more streams of toilet water blasted them back. The showers started spraying too, and together pushed the camouflage girls right out of the bathroom, spinning them around like pieces of garbage being washed away. As soon as they were out the door, I felt the tug in my stomach lessen, and the water shut off. Page 96. The entire bathroom was flooded. Annabeth was dripping wet, but she was standing in the same place, staring at me. I looked down and realized I was sitting in the only dry spot in the whole room. I was completely dry. I stood up, my legs shaky. Annabeth said, How did you do that? I don't know. We walked to the door. Outside, Clarice and her friends were sprawled in the mud, and a bunch of other campers had gathered around. Clarice gave me a look of hatred. You are dead, new boy. You are totally dead. I said, You want to gargle with toilet water again, Clarice? Close your mouth. Her friends had to hold her back from fighting me again. They dragged her toward cabin five. Annabeth stared at me. I couldn't tell whether she was just grossed out or angry at me for getting her wet. What, I demanded. What are you thinking? Page 97. I'm thinking, she said, that I want you on my team for Capture the Flag.